In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, here we are once again to thank you, praise you, bless you, honor you, glorify you, give you thanks and praise for who you are. And most of all, Lord God, to come as your children in your presence to hear you and to bless your holy name. We thank you, Father, each day through your spirit for teaching us, for directing us, for strengthening us, for giving us these truths and secrets of your kingdom and helping us to grow each day in our walk with you. Today, once again, Spirit of God, we ask you in a very special way to take complete control of this class, take complete control of all my faculties, my heart, my mind, my lips, my tongue, my vocal cords, nothing of me, everything of you. And Lord, as we together learn what you're going to teach us, help us to understand these truths. Give us understanding so that applying all that we learn, we can grow in the spirit and live the victorious life that Jesus has already promised us. We thank you and praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So once again, a warm welcome to each one of you, dear brothers and sisters. We are on the Gospel of Matthew, which we started last week. And today we continue with the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. Now, before we go to the Gospel of today, that is 31 to 35, this Gospel is a continuation of Jesus' public ministry. And here, Jesus is continuing to preach and teach the kingdom of God to the crowds, in parables. We saw that last week that Jesus would only speak to the crowds in parables, but when it came to the disciples, he taught them and he explained to them everything. He actually taught them all the secrets, he gave them all the revelations, he gave them all that the, the, the parables really meant to be, and there were some, even in the crowd, who later on even joined the disciples, because as we read the Gospel of Matthew, Luke, Mark, and even in John, we find that the number of disciples had gone even to about five to six hundred, which only goes to show that the disciples were not just the twelve of them, but people now from the crowds slowly but surely began to gain interest in Jesus' teaching. And now Jesus had a large inner circle apart from the eleven, from the twelve, whom he would now teach the revelations, he would give them the secrets, he would explain to them the word. And you know, brothers and sisters, the good news is, Jesus teaches us the same today. He's not there on this world to walk with us, in the sense that he's not there in the physical to walk with us, but we have much more, because he has given us the Holy Spirit. And it is the Holy Spirit who will teach us, that's what John chapter 14 verse 26 says, when the Holy Spirit comes, that's what Jesus said. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything that I've taught. That's what Jesus says. The Holy Spirit's job is twofold. He will teach us everything, plus he will remind us of everything that Jesus has already taught us. So today, when we look at that scripture, John 14, 26, how is it that he's going to teach us and how is it that he's going to remind us everything that Jesus taught? We have not walked with Jesus physically, but when we take God's word, when we study God's word, now under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, all that we study, all that we learn, the Holy Spirit will bring to our remembrance and he will make that teaching so simple, so easy for us to understand so that now when that situation comes, when those circumstances come, when those negative situations in our life come, the Holy Spirit will come and remind us he's living inside of us and he will remind us and he will give us the direction. He'll say, stop, move, go right, go left. And you know, brothers and sisters, today in the new covenant, as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are truly blessed. We are truly blessed. We are not like the people in the old covenant who couldn't be born anew. They couldn't receive the new birth. They couldn't receive the Holy Spirit. 
the prophets like Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Amos, all those prophets, they began to prophesy, but they would only prophesy with the Holy Spirit coming to them only externally and giving them that revelation only for that moment. But you and I who live in the new covenant because of the blood of Jesus, because Jesus went to the cross. Now, when we believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. Isn't this wonderful news? When we walk, God walks with us. When we sit down, God sits with us. When we go to sleep, the Holy Spirit is inside of us, is with us. So there is not a moment that God ever leaves us. And that's why Jesus said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And brothers and sisters, knowing that God is with us and in us, we can truly say we are blessed. And therefore, brothers and sisters, today, when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, the only thing we need to do is listen to his voice, be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And in order for the Holy Spirit to speak to us, we must study God's word. And we saw that yesterday, what we put inside of us, what we study inside of us, what we have let the word abide in us, is what the Holy Spirit, which is the word itself, will be speaking to us from inside out and giving us direction. And that's the time our faith will start working. That's the time our faith will be effective. And that's the time our faith will give us the result and take us to that destination which God has promised you and me. So let's go to verse number 31. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. Now Jesus has been teaching parables to the crowds. He's still with the crowds. He now teaches them another parable. And now the word of God says he's talking about a mustard seed. He's comparing the kingdom of God to a tiny mustard seed. You know, brothers and sisters, this parable about the mustard seed is actually Jesus teaching about growth in the kingdom of heaven. We must remember, if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we must grow. Everything in this life, everything that, you know, actually is on this planet Earth grows. And it grows only when it is nourished when it is fed, when it is taken care of. And we, apart from growing physically, many of us think that, you know, by the time we are teenagers, 17, 18, we don't grow much in height, but we do grow otherwise. We grow stouter, maybe we grow, you know, you know, in, in physically in some way or another. But there is a growth that needs to take place right from the time we are conceived in our mother's womb to the time we are put in the tomb. Right from womb to tomb, there is a growth that every believer of the Lord Jesus Christ must have. And when this growth will take place? This growth will only take place, brothers and sisters, when we feed ourselves with the word of God. Just like we take our breakfast, our lunch, our dinner, we take snacks, we have meals in order to feed ourselves so that this food which we eat will give us energy and that will allow us to give us the energy to work and do all our chores in the house and even at our work and wherever we are. In the same way, the word of God is food for our souls. It is the food that allows us to take in so that our faith starts getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Remember, we learned yesterday, God has already planted faith inside of us. But this faith must be sustained by the word of God. If we don't take the word of God on a regular basis, there is no way that the Holy Spirit is going to start speaking to us. We are going to be more focused on the things of this world. We are going to listen to all the garbage of this world. We are going to listen to all the television reports, the newspaper reports, what the magazines are saying, what the books are saying, what the people of this world are saying. And our distraction will go from the word to the world 
and now fear will set in and instead of we operating according to kingdom principles we are going to get sucked into the world and start operating according to the world and therefore brothers and sisters it is very important for us to be continually in god's word we need to meditate on his word there is no vacation for a christian when i say vacation meaning doesn't mean vacation that you don't go to a place and have a vacation with with your family or with with your loved ones the vacation when I, when i talk about a vacation for a christian is the christian or a believer of the lord jesus christ should never take a vacation by from his mind his mind needs to be continually focused on god's word never allowing anything contrary to the word of god to actually come into this mind because the moment it comes into the mind contrary to god's word that word which we are going to receive contrary to the word is going to make us think it's going to make us speak and is finally going to lead us into an action which is going to bring our own destruction and therefore brothers and sisters it is very important for us as christians as believers to keep this mind at rest to keep this mind focused on the word to keep this mind continually meditating and thinking on god's word so that the holy spirit can continually direct us we need to be sensitive to god's word we need to be sensitive to the holy spirit so that now the holy spirit can direct us to that destination to that goal which god has promised us and remember brothers and sisters the more we start feeding ourselves with god's word the more we start eating there is no such thing as overeating you can overeat god's word and the more you overeat when you eat if you eat physical food overeat physical food it's probably going to end up in extra calories you will go overweight there will be sicknesses there will be weight problems there will be health problems but taking an overweight of the word of god or taking an overdose of god's word there is no side effects it's only good for us and what happens the more we take god's word the more we are becoming like the one we are studying and that is who jesus christ himself that's what it says in uh, john chapter 17 verse 3 eternal life is all about a relationship with god and with jesus so the more we study his word the more we begin to know him the more the revelation the more we start thinking about him the more we become like him and that is why in last sunday's reading that was yesterday in the second reading we read what saint paul writes to the romans in chapter 8 verses 28 to 31 let us read that romans chapter 8 verses 28 to 31 we know that all things work together for good for those who love god who are called according to his purpose for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family and those whom he predestined he also called and those whom he called he also justified and those whom he justified he also glorified so here brothers and sisters we read that we were called predestined we were predestined to conform to the image of jesus himself what a privilege you and i have been predestined by god to conform to the image of christ himself and the day we received christ on the inside we became exactly like christ many of us cannot come to the you know to the realization of this truth that on the inside the day we receive christ we have become exactly like christ in our spirit because when our spirit is made brand new by believing the gospel of jesus christ 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 says we are a new creature we are a new being we are a new species and we are exactly like Christ but in our minds in our bodies we are still not renewed and that is why every day as we take the word of god as we feed ourselves on god's word this mind is continually being cleaned that's what jesus said in john chapter 15 verse 3 you have already been cleaned by the word that i have spoken to you so the more we begin to hear god's word the more we hear god speaking to us through his word 
the more we are getting cleaned in our mind, that mind is getting clean, that mind is conforming to the spirit. And now we are receiving good health. We walk in divine health. We walk in prosperity. We walk in the abundant life that God has promised us. And now we are able to go and share the good news with others. Remember brothers and sisters, God's will for his children is to live an abundant life. Many people are preaching that Christians should live a very pathetic life. They should live a life of poverty. They should live a life, you know, of, you know, absolutely a, a terrible life. But the word of God says, if we are the children of God and God is our father, we are supposed to live a life of abundance. We are supposed to live a life which is good. We are supposed to have a quality life. And even though we live that quality life, it doesn't mean that we focus on what we have, but to whom we belong to. And that is Jesus Christ himself. So the more we conform to the image and likeness of Christ each day, we are bringing more and more people into that kingdom. We are inviting people by the very life we live. Remember, a true believer, a true Christian doesn't live for himself. He always lives for someone else. He always lives for his master. And just as Jesus came on this earth to live not for himself, but to live for others, you and I who believe in Jesus are not just called to live for ourselves but we are called to live for a whole community. We are called to live as brothers and sisters and invite everyone to this kingdom. So remember brothers and sisters, we are called to conform to the image of Christ himself. And when we were predestined by Christ, now we have been made brand new on the inside. The word of God says, according to St. Paul, we were chosen and he conformed us to the image of his son, Jesus. So the more he chose us, he now justified us. And he, when he justified us, he glorified us. Can you imagine brothers and sisters, God glorifies his children. God glorifies his children. Why? Because when his children believe in the son of God, they do what the word says that God, which is inside of them, is now glorified. It's not glory to you and me when we believe in Jesus, but it is the glory to the Christ in us. And now the world, which has got no Christ, sees the glory of God through you and me, and now are attracted to the kingdom of God. The mustard seed, which Jesus is talking today in today's parable, is the smallest of all seeds. It is one of the most tiniest seeds. And yet, brothers and sisters, the mustard tree, once the seed has been planted into the ground, it grows up into a tree, which is almost about three to four meters in height. Can you imagine? And this is why Jesus is contrasting the littleness, the tininess of that mustard seed to what it can grow to be in the future. Remember, a mustard seed is such a tiny seed. It's so tiny that you can't imagine that when it is planted in the ground, it can grow into a plant of almost three to four meters in height. And what happens when that tree, which is such a tiny seed grows into a height of three to four meters, that tree can now have nest inside of it for the birds of the air. Remember brothers and sisters, the church on earth, the church of Jesus Christ, was started by a few disciples whom Jesus taught during his earthly ministry. How many disciples were there? There were just 12 of them. One of them betrayed Jesus. His name is Judas. And then they added another person whose name was, um, he was um, Matthias. So Matthias was added, but it doesn't end with only the 12 disciples. What happened? So many more people joined in and they went out and they preach the good news of Jesus Christ. And today you and I, brothers and sisters, are believers. We are belonging to the family of God because those few disciples went out and proclaimed the good news. That's how the kingdom of God begins. It began with just a few bunch of people, Jesus and his disciples in Jerusalem. And today, the word of God has reached to the ends of the earth. There are believers right from the North Pole to the South Pole. Remember, the kingdom of God starts like a small, tiny mustard seed. And in the same way, the kingdom of God will also grow 
just like a tiny mustard seed when thrown into the ground, when it dies into a big tree, which can now have nest in that and birds of the air can grow. That's what happened, brothers and sisters. When the day of Pentecost came, when Jesus went up to, the, to heaven, you got ascended into heaven. The day of Pentecost, the disciples who were timid, who were fearful because of the Jews, the day they received the Holy Spirit, the word of God says in Acts chapter 2 verse 41 that Peter proclaimed the first gospel. He preached the first gospel. Jesus, when he preached, he did not have the opportunity to preach to people who, had born, who were born again, who, did, who had the new birth. Because all the people whom Jesus preached were people who were still not having the second birth. They were all people who were dead in the spirit. So all they could do was understand with their minds. But when the Holy Spirit came, Peter was able to preach to that crowd and under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, now those people accepted Christ. Let us read what happens in Acts chapter 2 verse 41. So those who welcomed his message were baptized and that day about 3,000 persons were added. 3,000 persons were added into the kingdom of God in one, God, one sermon on the day of Pentecost. Remember, brothers and sisters, the mustard seed is a tiny seed, but when it grows, it grows into a big tree. In the same way, one disciple, Peter, he goes out and preaches the good news of Jesus Christ. And in one day, from something like about 12 to 500 people, 3,000 souls by hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ are brought into the kingdom of God. Isn't that such a wonderful news? This is what exactly what Jesus was talking about. He was saying, just like a mustard seed, the kingdom of God grows into a big tree. Just like the mustard seed grows into a big tree, in the same way, the kingdom of God also starts in a very tiny way, in a very small way. It never starts in a big way. It starts in a small way. And now as time passes by, as people get committed, now that kingdom of God grows and grows. And that is why today you have Jesus being proclaimed in the different parts of the world. What happened in Acts chapter 3? In Acts chapter 3, Peter heals a lame man. There was a lame man in Acts chapter 3, a man who was always at the temple begging. And, G and Peter says to him, when he's going with John to the temple, he says, silver and gold I have none, but I give you what I have in the name of Jesus Christ, rise. And that lame man got up and there was a miracle. And at that miracle, 5,000 people accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord. Imagine, brothers and sisters, one healing brought so many souls into the kingdom of God. Her first preaching brought about 3,000 souls. A second miracle, the first miracle which Peter performed brings 5,000 souls. So a tiny seed which Jesus sowed into the disciples brought a harvest. And today now we know that there are so many people who walk on this earth. So remember brothers and sisters, the growth continues even today. And we must first experience a personal growth in our life then that growth should go to the community then it should grow to the bigger church if there is no personal growth if we ourselves are not growing spiritually if we are just happy to do the bare minimum like you know we go to our sunday service or we go once a week to the to the service and occasionally we do our family prayer if we are not really keen to grow there is no way the community is going to grow. And if the community is not going to grow, then the kingdom of God is not going to grow. So the responsibility for the growth of the kingdom of God lies with you and me, brothers and sisters. Remember, we are not come here just to pass our time or just to occupy space. God has put you and me on this planet Earth for a very specific reason. The word of God says we were predestined to conform to the image of Christ. If we were predestined, that means God chose us. We are also responsible in order to expand this kingdom. God is looking to you and me, brothers and sisters, in order to advance the kingdom of God. And therefore... 
in order for this kingdom to expand we can't be looking to other people we can't be looking to a few preachers we can't look to the priests we can't look to the holy sisters and all the others we need to look at each of ourselves and see how we can contribute in order for this kingdom of god to advance then brothers and sisters jesus talks about the birds in the air making their nest in the tree in the mustard in the mustard tree in the mustard seed tree when the mustard seed has been planted in the ground it's a tiny seed but when it grows it grows into a tree of about, tree of about three to four meters and what happens the birds of the air build their nest and they make their homes in a mustard tree can you imagine brothers and sisters this parable which jesus spoke of the sower and the seed which we which we reflected on last week also designates satan as the bird that comes and takes away the seed. Remember, the, the seed that fell on the pathway, the first seed that fell on the pathway, when what happens? The birds of the air come and immediately take that seed away. And now that seed is not able to be planted in our hearts because we fail to understand God's word. So Satan has been designated as that bird and it is brothers and sisters, this bird that also is now present even in the church today. Remember, the, the, the Satan, don't you think that Satan has only got a place in hell? He has also infiltrated into the church. There are so many false prophets. There are so many professors, as they say, who have infiltrated into the church with false teaching and, and, and philosophies causing such huge damage to the body of Christ. Remember, brothers and sisters, not everywhere the truth of the gospel is preached. Not everywhere. Jesus has warned us that in the days to come, there will be false prophets who will go and preach the gospel, which is contrary to the true gospel. Even St. Paul warned people. He says, when I go away, Bulls will come and will take away the flock. They will mislead the flock. They will teach them all sorts of philosophies, teach them all sorts of genealogies and take them away from the truth. Brothers and sisters, if there is going to be a judgment and there will be one, there is going to be a segregation of the sheep and the goat on the day of judgment. That's what Jesus says. When he comes on the last day, there will be the sheep that will be taken on his right. There will be the goats who will be put on his left. And they will be segregated from the people who are there right at that time. And only the sheep who heard his voice, who listened to his voice, who were sensitive to the Holy Spirit, only shall make it to eternal life with God for all eternity. Remember, brothers and sisters, there is a judgment that is going to come. Matthew chapter 25 verses 31 to 46. We are not going to read that. But in Matthew chapter 25 verses 31 to 46, Jesus actually talks about the separation that will take place between the sheep and the goats. And when that happens, there is no such thing as a second chance. There is no such thing as chance that I'm going to repent. There is no chance for me to, you know, make the necessary correction. The correction that I need to make is today, right now, because now is the day of salvation. Today is the day for us to repent. Today is the day for us to make that decision to be the sheep, to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, to be the servants and to be the flock of that master who gave his life for us. And so brothers and sisters, we can look at these birds as Satan who comes to destroy the body of Christ. We can also look at it in another way. Birds represent those who strive to advance God's kingdom. That's what it says in Luke chapter 16, verse 16. Let us read. Because the kingdom of God is being taken by force. There are people who are taking the kingdom of God by force. Let us read Luke chapter 16, verse 16. The law and the prophets were in effect until John came. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is proclaimed and everyone tries to enter it by force. Everyone tries to enter the kingdom by force. There is violence in order to enter the kingdom of God. Remember, brothers and sisters, 
if you and i understand to whom we belong to when you and i understand that we belong to the kingdom of god god is our master jesus is our brother we are children of the most high and when we understand that we will definitely make every step to advance god's kingdom but at the same time we must be aware that both good and bad people are also entering inside all are trying to enter by force but satan is also going to bring a, a confusion but the word of god says that at the right time that is at the time of harvest that is the time of judgment the darnel which the satan has already put into the wheat they will be separated and they shall be put into the everlasting fire and there will be the wheat which god will take and will put it into his barns in order to enjoy for all eternity and that wheat represents all those who are sensitive to the holy spirit who believe in the lord jesus christ who believe that they have been saved by the precious blood of jesus so remember brothers and sisters when we reflect on this verse the mustard seed represents a tiny seed but when the kingdom of god grows it grows so huge and that growth needs to start with you and me that growth needs to start in our own spirit first growing each day to become more and more like the master himself so that we can go out and make a difference in the kingdom of god verse number 32 it is the smallest of all the seeds but when it has grown it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches now brothers and sisters the mustard seed is such a tiny seed compared to what its plant eventually grows in the same way the kingdom of god starts in such a tiny way it starts in such a insignificant way nobody even realizes that the kingdom of god has just begin to sprout but it goes on to become such a large kingdom when those who are faithful and committed trust god to let them be used to make that happen remember brothers and sisters god wants you and me to agree with him god god wants you and me to commit ourselves to him god wants you and me to be faithful to him because this god is a faithful god this god is a god who's truly committed to his children so when yesterday we heard in isaiah 55 verse 11 it says the word of god the word that goes out of god's mouth shall not return to him empty but shall accomplish all that he desires and achieve the purpose for which he sent it in the same way this word that we believe in is such a word that is so firm it never changes it doesn't change like the weather it doesn't change like our moods it doesn't change because of our feelings it is firm and it shall never change and when we are committed to this word when we are committed and faithful to the faithfulness and commitment of god now god can use you and me in order to advance this king and make things happen in his kingdom here on earth we always pray that prayer our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven so we pray thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven remember brothers and sisters god's kingdom is already in heaven he is the lord in heaven everybody obeys the law of god in heaven but here on earth in order for god's kingdom to come he needs you and me in order to obey his word in order to be trusting his word in order to be committed to his word so that now his kingdom can also come here on earth he came here sent his son with his precious blood washed us clean and when we believe what he has done for us now we can work with him and bring his kingdom to pass here on earth as well and every generation that commits itself to god's word commits itself and trust god to use 
use them in order to advance his kingdom is only hastening Jesus' second coming. Remember, God is not going to come again unless he gives everyone a fair chance to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And so, brothers and sisters, we are talking about eternity here. Everything that we do on this planet Earth must always be done with eternity as our focus. We are not working for tomorrow. We are not working for two years from now. We are not working for 50 years from now. We are working for that prize which we shall get on the day of Jesus Christ. That crown which shall never be taken away. That crown which we shall have for all eternity. And remember brothers and sisters, it is important for us that whatever we do in, on this planet earth as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must always do it by keeping eternity as our focus, by keeping eternity as our goal, because that's where we are all going to go one day. That's the place where we shall receive our reward, a reward that nothing can take away. Verse number 33. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like east that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The parable of the yeast and the dough are again representing what a little yeast can do to expand the flour and make the apparent quantity or the space it occupies much bigger. We all know those of us who have gone to the bakery and seen how the baker, when he mixes the dough, he puts a little bit of yeast and how the whole thing expands from a small quantity. So in the same way, brothers and sisters, just as a little quantity of yeast can actually make the whole dough to be leavened, to be increased in quantity, just by that little dough, just by the little yeast. In the same way, the kingdom of God also starts small. It starts in a very small way and grows till it affects everything. Remember, the kingdom of God always affects everything. The choice is with us. The, the point that Jesus is making in this parable is just like yeast can make such a difference with a little dough in the same way, the kingdom of God also starts small and it goes on to affect so many lives. It goes on to affect generations. It goes on to affect our entire history. The change takes place, brothers and sisters, in our individual life. And then it affects those with whom we come in contact. And this is why it is very important for us, each one of us, to grow in the spirit each day. Unless growth is taking place in us, unless we are growing in the spirit, unless we are growing in the knowledge of God, unless we are growing in the grace of God, unless we are growing in the peace of God, we will never be able to give that peace or that grace, or that joy, or anything of the kingdom to those who don't know Christ. The world without Christ is looking to you and me, brothers and sisters, in order to experience what you and I are experiencing. If there is no difference between you and me and the people of this world, what would make the people of this world without Christ attracted to the kingdom of God? Because they will say what they do and we do is no different. But when they see the difference, they see the way the children of God are living, see the way the children of God are prospering, see the children of God living in that peace and the grace of God. Now, the people outside are definitely going to get attracted to the kingdom of God. And this is why, brothers and sisters, it is so important for each one of us who believe in Jesus to grow each day in the grace of God, in the knowledge of God, and most of all, in the love of Jesus Christ. Verse number 34. Jesus told the crowd <clears throat> all these things in parables. Without a parable, he told them nothing. Now here, the word of God says that Jesus always spoke to the crowds in parables. He never spoke to the crowds by giving them an explanation. And why is that? We saw that last week. Remember, God does not want to waste his time giving people something which is holy and something precious when they are not interested. The word of God says, do not give what is holy to dogs 
and do not give what your pearls to the swine because the swine will just walk over the pearls and the dogs will come and eat you up. In the same way, Jesus used his wisdom. Whenever he went to the crowds, he preached them in parables. But the moment the crowds heard it and they showed interest, they would come to him and they would say, Master, can you please explain to us? And Jesus was more than willing, more than happy to explain to the people who came to him because they really sought the kingdom of God. They really seek, they were really seeking him. And this is what happened to so many people, not only for the 12, but people like Mary Magdalene. There were so many people who came. There was someone by the name of Nicodemus who came by the night. There were people like Matthew, the tax collector. So many people who really sought Jesus experienced a life of transformation when they came to the master. And we must remember brothers and sisters, in the congregation of Jesus 2000 years ago, there were three types of people. There were the crowds, there were the disciples, and there were also the Pharisees. Remember, three types of people in Jesus' congregation. So with the crowds, what would happen? The crowds came only for entertainment. They came only to see a few miracles. They came there so that their food could be multiplied. They could be taken care of. Their food could be taken care of. Or they could get some miracle from Jesus. So that was the crowd. They only came in order to hear God's word and to expect something to happen and go back home. Then came the Pharisees. What did they come for? They never came to hear. They never came to change. They only came to find fault with Jesus. They only came to criticize. They actually came to the meeting of Jesus only to see who this Jesus is. What is he preaching? Who he thinks he is? We have the law. We have got all the things we are doing. Everything is going fine with us. Who this man Jesus thinks he is? So that was the Pharisees. And Jesus could not save the Pharisees because they were just not interested in believing in him. And they condemned themselves to all eternity. They condemned themselves to hell. And finally, there were the disciples. The disciples were the one who heard the word of God. If they did not understand, they would come to the master and say, Lord, please explain it to us. Please give us the understanding of the word. And they were the ones who always received from Jesus. They were the ones whom Jesus truly opened up the, the secrets of the kingdom. And he gave them the revelation of the kingdom of God. And remember, brothers and sisters, today we need to ask ourselves, are we the Pharisees? Are we the crowd? Or are we the disciples? This is a question each one only can ask. Are we the crowd who just come, you know, just to feel good that we have heard something. We don't take any notes. We don't even review what we learned. We don't even want to think of applying. We don't even think of changing our life. We just want to hear it and feel good that we came to a prayer meeting or we came to a Bible study. There are others who come there like the Pharisees. What is happening? What is this guy thinking of himself? We've got, our, we've got so many people. We've got our church. Things are going fine. All these years, things have been going fine. Why do these people use technology? Why do they want to preach the word of God? Who they think they really are? Could be the Pharisees. And then there could be the disciples who really take the word of God. They listen to it. They understand the truth. And they begin to apply it and begin to see their life being transformed. They begin to see the power of God flowing in their life. So brothers and sisters, today is a day we need to ask this question to ourselves. Are we really growing? Are we really growing in the spirit? Are we really applying that word in our day-to-day -day life? Are we really being transformed on the outside as we were chained on the inside in the likeness of God and Christ himself? Or are we just like the Pharisees or just like the crowd? We need to ask this question because growth in the kingdom of God is the most important thing, brothers and sisters. If we are not growing, we are not going to really grow to become disciples. And if we don't become disciples, there is a danger that when the trials come, when the persecution comes, when the storm comes, we will fall like a pack of cards. It's important for us to be strong in the world, to grow with our, in our spiritual muscles, because days are coming when there will be different storms in our life. There is right now one storm that is going on of this pandemic, but this is not only a storm. This is just probably the tip of the iceberg. The word of God says in Matthew 24 and many other gospel passages of the synoptic gospel where Jesus says in the last days, all these things are going to happen. These are the pangs of childbirth. 
These are the pains that a person has to go who's going to deliver a baby, the pangs and the pains of childbirth. So what we are experiencing right now is only the tip of the iceberg. It is important for us to grow in our walk with Jesus, to grow in our faith with Jesus, to grow in our disciplehood with Jesus. Verse number 35. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth to speak in parables. I will proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. Here in verse 35, Jesus is actually quoting Psalm 78 verse 2. And again, it also says in Psalm 49 verse 4. And remember, brothers and sisters, this is the same Jesus who grew in the word of God, sitting at the feet of his mother in Nazareth. Remember, when Jesus was only 12 years old, he was actually discussing with the, with the, with the Pharisees, the scribes and the experts in the temple when he was lost. Remember in Luke chapter 2, Jesus was lost in the temple at 12 years old. And even at 12 years, he knew the scriptures because his mother would take time to teach her son the word of God. And here, during his ministry days, Jesus was actually speaking the words of scripture. Let us read what verse 35 says, already prophesied in Psalm 78 verse 2 and Psalm 49 verse 4. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old. I will utter my mouth in parables. That's what the Lord says. And these are words prophesied in Psalm so many centuries, even before Christ came on this world. Let us read Psalm 49 verse 4. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will solve my riddle to the music of the harp. So brothers and sisters, when Jesus spoke this verse 35, he was actually talking about Psalm 78 and Psalm 49. Remember brothers and sisters, unlike those in the old covenant who did not have the opportunity for the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit could not lick residence into the homes of people. Jesus had still not gone to the cross. And brothers and sisters, they did not have the opportunity in order to listen to all these secrets of the kingdom. All these hidden truths were hidden from mankind in the old covenant. But what a privilege you and I have in the new covenant that all these secrets are being made known to us by the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. The truth has been hidden for us. The truth has been hidden for us, but the truth has not been hidden from us. Let me say this again. In the new covenant, the truth is hidden for us. It's not very evident. But the moment we go and dwell on God's word, the moment we sit under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we make the effort to study God's word. Now, the Holy Spirit is going to teach us the word. And now, the truth will be made known to us. So, brothers and sisters, the truth has not been hidden for us. But the truth has the truth has been hidden for us, but the truth has not been hidden from, from us. And it is very important for us to understand that we can never get all these secrets with our own understanding. That's what Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 says. Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. With our own understanding, brothers and sisters, it is impossible for us to understand God's word. It is only the Holy Spirit who can help us. And it is important for us in order for the Holy Spirit to help us, to give us the knowledge of God's word, that we need to humble ourselves. We need to empty ourselves and allow God to teach us. Let me say this again. If we want to be disciples and in the school of the Holy Spirit, we really want to grow in our walk with Jesus. It is important for us not to come with our own knowledge, not to come with, with some preconceived notions, not to come with philosophies and all the knowledge of this world. We need to humble ourselves. We need to empty ourselves of whatever we know so that now the Holy Spirit can teach us the word and can give us the wisdom, can give us the secrets 
and give us most of all that direction in order to fulfill your purpose and my purpose in this life. Let us pray.